So chapter 10 is really all about liabilities, um, looking at some of the details here and introducing you to a few new ones that you haven't uh, heard of yet that are introduced in this part of, uh, of the chapter. And then we're gonna do a little bit of analysis. It's actually a repeat of the stuff you were introduced to way back in chapter two. So it's actually uh, relatively light. Okay, so in terms of objectives, uh, all of one uh, and most of two uh, is really what the focus uh, is here in terms of your reading. We are going to be a little bit of doing a little bit of analysis, which is part of ob objective four. Okay, so learning objective one focuses on current liabilities. It's amazing how many current liabilities a company has. You already were aware of many of them. And remember, a current liability is any debt that they expect to pay uh, within that one year period, right? Um, all current liabilities are paid from current assets. Cash is, is the, the way that they're usually paid. And the current liability accounts that you've already been introduced to include notes payable, accounts payable, uh, unearned revenue, and there's a whole bunch of other payables like uh, Taxes payable, interest payable, salary that we just payable. You were introduced back in chapter four when we were doing adjusting entries for that. Uh, but clearly, there's a lot of payables. Okay, um, not to go over this too much detail, but you already know what a note's payable is. It is a promissory note. It's a loan. Remember the word note and loan mean the same thing, which means that there's interest and a due date. Right? Notes payable. Um, are due on a particular due date, everything is to pay, be paid back on that day. The full amount of the note, the full amount of the loan, plus the interest on that loan, all paid on the due date, okay? All paid on the due date, all right? Um, your book goes over a little bit about how notes payable is uh, listed in the, in the journal, which is things you already know already, and you're not gonna be getting that. Here's something that's new and exciting. Um, Sales tax payable. Now, when you go to a store and you buy something that's a taxable product, uh, you're going to be paying more than just the price of the product. You'll be paying the price plus the tax, the sales tax. Well, uh, companies are the ones who collect that tax from the customer. It's not their money. It's not their money. Uh, they have to uh, send that to the Department of Revenue at the state. Now, a sales tax is no national sales tax. Sales taxes are state-level taxes on certain uh, goods. Um, and, uh, and of course, there might be some local additional local sales taxes that are applied. So businesses are the ones who actually collect that tax. And they are responsible for remitting that which is why before you even can go into business, um, you need to have a tax identification number and an account with the State Department of Revenue because they're gonna want to keep collecting that sales tax and other taxes you're collecting for them on a regular basis. You'd be such good buddies. Okay, so basically speaking, this is how it works, right? So for a large grocery store, uh, if they had sales of $10,000 and they collected taxes of $600 on that, they would collect a total of $10,600, but only 10,000 of that is theirs, their revenue. The other $600 is not theirs, they owe it to the state. That's a sales tax payable, that's a current liability. These are paid uh, very quickly, in fact. Okay. Um, unearned revenue, you've been introduced to this account uh, several times already uh, from actually chapter one on. And again, just remember how important it is Right, the customer is giving you money before you deliver the goods or before you do the service for them. Okay, and so uh, that's very, very important. And it's so many businesses do this. Okay, here they have the airline industry, uh, the hotel industry, um, in the cruise industry. There's a whole bunch, you know, and any type of ticket, you know, for sporting events or concerts or things like this. They they all do it. So uh, how it works basically is when the, uh, in this case, it's a university selling football tickets, season tickets, 50 bucks each. They have a five game season, 10,000 season tickets. So what happens is they're gonna collect a whole bunch of money, half a million dollars, but it's all unearned ticket revenue. 
Okay, it's all onto liability for them because they owe people these games. Right? That's what they're paying for. When you buy season tickets, you're paying for a series of games. So when you give all that cash up front for those tickets, it's a liability for the organization. So after each and every game, this university is able to say that they've earned 100,000 of the 500,000 each game, okay? Because it's a five game schedule and 500,000 was collected. So 100,000 each game. So thus you debit the unearned revenue. Remember unearned is a liability. Any type of revenue has been earned. So that's a big difference here. And again, it's a good reminder um, to review that. One other thing that you might not have known um, about this is that, yes, a lot of companies have long-term debt, but the current portion of that long-term debt is, that's due this year is actually counted as a current liability. Okay. So here they have an illustration of a construction company they have a, a five-year interest-bearing $25,000 note. They're going to pay back $5,000 a year every year on that note. So when they actually prepare their financial statements, the $5,000 that's due that year is actually a current liability. Okay, it's actually going to be a current liability. The other amount that's left on the loan, in this case, they just made it, so it's $20,000. So of this $25,000 long-term debt, because they're paying 5,000 of it this year, 5,000 is part of that current liability system, uh, classification, and the other 20 is part of the long-term liabilities. So, so that's something you might not have known uh, that you will learn about. The very new thing is just how important uh, the role of companies play in collecting other taxes. And the most important taxes they have are payroll taxes that they collect. Um, payroll taxes are, uh, are, are, well, there are many. There are some mandatory ones, for example, Social Security and Medicare uh, tax. Those are mandatory. Everyone has to pay those regardless whether you're only working one hour a week or you know, 51 hours a week. It doesn't really matter. Everyone's paying into that. Um, you know, you're never exempt from paying Social Security and Medicare tax. Um, there might be folks that don't make a lot of money every year, so they don't need to pay like federal income tax or state income tax. But those are also things that are collected out of your out of paychecks and uh, need to be delivered. So first of all, when it comes to payroll, you look at two very different types of ways that uh, there's laws that that affect payroll. <laughs> Uh, going back to the Fair, Fair Labor Standards Act or Fair, yeah, I think it's Fair Labor Standards Act or something like this. Um, that was the act way back in the 1930s that created uh, a 40 hour work week. And uh, for those that are paid by the hour. So any, any worker who works more than 40 hours in a week is required under the law to pay time and a half. Um, so after 40 hours for that week. So that only applies to wage workers. A wage worker is when you apply for a job and when you get hired, they quote you a rate per hour. So we'd like to hire you at $20 an hour to work for us. And you say, great, you're a wage worker which means that if you work over 40 hours in every given week, the law says they have to pay you time and a half for those any hour after 40. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody else, it, if they're hired at a monthly or yearly rate, so a lot of people are getting educated, they want, you might wanna be an accountant or a salesperson or a business executive, you're gonna get hired on a, uh, an annual salary. We'd like to hire you for $52,000 a year. If that's how your job is offered and you accept, you're a salaried worker. Salaried workers do not get paid overtime. Okay, there are a few exceptions uh, by that, but uh, overwhelmingly, the general rule is if you're a salaried employee, there's no overtime. So it doesn't really matter if you work 40, 50, or 60 hours, you're still getting the same uh, pay. What pay are they talking about for the most part? Well, the first thing they do is they calculate your gross earnings which is the number of, for if you're a wage worker, it's the number of hours you work that week, time your wages per hour. 
That's your gross. For a salaried worker, it's simply your yearly salary divided by the number of paychecks that your company gives every year. If you get paid weekly, there'll be 52 checks, right? So let's say you were hired at $52,000 a year to be an accountant for a business. So your gross earnings will every week will be $1,000 a week. Okay, that's how they do it. There are payroll deductions that are mandatory and some that are voluntary. Uh, again, your payroll taxes, particularly I'll go back to that Social Security and Medicare, what's called a FICA tax. That is required for everybody. That's a required deduction, okay? Um, and then there are folks that, again, have federal income tax withheld, state income tax withheld, uh, plus they have other deductions because they contribute to some of their benefits like health care or something like this. Um, so all of those deductions show up. The difference between your gross pay and all those deductions is what, what your cash, what your check is, your cash, uh, the cash portion, which is net pay. Okay, so your net pay is basically after all those deductions are taken out of your gross pay. That's what's that's what that's what's left for you. <laughs> okay. Okay. So here's an assumption about a large corporation. Say it's Cargo Corporation, and they have a payroll for uh, the week of March seventh, and their payroll is hundred thousand uh, dollars a week. So every week they will literally have a salaries or wages expense for $100,000, okay? Again, that's the expense. But as you see, there's a ton of liabilities that are created when they actually do their payroll expense every week. First, they have to take out the Social Security and Medicare tax. That's the FICA taxes, Social Security and Medicare. Then for those employees that pay federal income taxes, there's federal income taxes that are withheld and that's a payable because that has to be sent to the government. So the FICA tax and the federal income tax uh, withholding gets sent to the IRS. The IRS is the tax collection agency for the federal government. Um, state income taxes uh, that are collected out of your check are remitted to the Department of Revenue. At, your, at the state level. It's the same place where the sales taxes go. Okay. So businesses have these very intricate relationships with government because business, we rely on businesses to, um, uh, to collect taxes and, and remit them on our behalf. So uh, it's, it's a, it is the way it is yeah, and it works out well. What's left is the amount of cash the company really needs to cover its payroll checks, the net pay. Right? So that's your, your salaries and wages payable. In this case, they only need $67,564 of cash to cover their $100,000 payroll that week because all the rest of this stuff is gonna be payable and a lot, these are all liabilities that will be sent to the government. So when they actually do cut the checks um, for payday, they're going to be uh, debiting their pay salaries wages payable because they've paid it. So this will zero out. And that money will come out of cash, as you'll see there. And that happens every single pay. What you don't see is that um, businesses themselves have their own payroll tax expenses, okay? Very specifically, it's, it's on employers only, okay? What you see coming out of your check is one thing. What you don't see is what the business has to do um, on, on their side as well. They have their own little payroll tax issues to go through. One thing they have to do is for every penny you put into Social Security and Medicare, that FICA tax, they have to match it. Okay. So again, for every dollar you put in, they put in a dollar for you as well. That's on your behalf. That's a tax on employers. Another thing they have to do is they have to pay uh, a certain, it's a smaller percentage um, of people's beginning salaries. I think it's you know, on the first, uh, maybe $6,000 of earnings each year. Then the uh, employers are required to pay something called an unemployment tax. And that's because the unemployment compensation uh, system that 
is run by the government, uh, where as people get laid off, they apply for unemployment compensation, they get a to get a paycheck. This is where the government gets that money to run that program. They tax the employers, they collect the money from those employers, and thus as people get laid off uh, or as businesses close, like we've seen happen through the pandemic, uh, people will apply for payroll, uh, for unemployment, and this is where the money comes from uh, for that benefit, okay? Okay, and then your, your, uh, your book has uh, uh, an example of what this looks like behind the scenes, right? They'll have, the business will have its own payroll tax expense because again, like I said, they're matching what you put in to FICA dollar for dollar, plus they're paying, uh, they owe the federal government and the state a portion of the unemployment tax for the unemployment compensation system, okay? And again, that's an additional expense. You don't see this, but that's an additional expense that's strictly on employers. Okay. okay. So you've seen a lot of fraud, so I will let you be. Um, the do it exercise just goes over that uh, type of thing. And that's really, um, it's more conceptual. I think you need to know what's going on behind that. But you've been introduced to a lot of new current liabilities today. So let's move on to the long term. <clears throat> and one of the most important things you can know about for long term liabilities is a bond. Okay. And uh, bonds are loans from investors to corporations and government agencies across the, across the board. Um, the bond market is as important to our capitalist system as the stock market is because both the bond market and the stock market is how corporations raise money from investors. The stock market is raising money for ownership. The bond market is where lenders, investors are going to lend their money. They want interest on that money. And so that's the bond market. Um, we're going to focus on corporations, of course, here. One bond is $1,000. Okay. So, um, and corporations don't just uh, borrow a thousand dollars. Say, oh, thanks a lot. Uh, when they go to the bond market to raise money, they're raising hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, usually, um, sometimes more. So, um, but each bond is a thousand dollar loan, represents a thousand dollar loan. Okay. So, when the corporation issues bonds, it's just saying they sell bonds to investors they're borrowing that money from the investor. The investor is called a bondholder. Okay, it's an investment for them, but not for the corporation. It represents debt and it's long-term debt. So every time you see the word bond, you're gonna think of long-term debt and a bond is a loan from investors, right? synonymous with the bond market. Two types of bonds in general that are issued, um, bonds that are secured, and bonds that are unsecured. So let's do secured first. Um, so secured bonds basically are loans, right? Bonds are loans from investors, but the investors now, uh, the company has pledged collateral for those bonds. And so this is very common in corporations that do equipment bonds. That's a very common bond, by, by the way, uh, equipment bonds where uh, in corporations will say, look, we need to borrow a 500, um, million dollars because we're buying all this equipment, but we're pledging all this equipment as collateral for you as the bondholder. So in case we can't pay you back, you actually own the equipment. So it kind of makes the bondholder feel secure. So it's a secured bond because it's secured by collateral. An unsecured bond is just the opposite. It's basically what is the general reputation of the corporation? Uh, you and I, as people, we have credit scores, and we know that because we've all heard about FICO and all this other scores, this type of stuff. Corporations have credit ratings, okay? So it's very much like a credit score, but it's specific to a corporation. And it is basically a way that investors who are interested in lending money to corporations, to give them an idea of the risk that's involved in lending money to a particular corporation. Some corporations have very high credit ratings, 
And thus it's not very risky to lend your money to that corporation because they have, you know, financially they're very strong. They've had a long history of borrowing money and paying it back. You know, they're, they're, in, they're a mature company with lots of, of assets and lots of uh, products and sales. So there's not much risk there. They're, it's easy to lend them money. Uh, of course, you're not going to get a high interest rate if you're lending a very good uh, credit risk, you know, person, you know, if they're, if they're almost as good as gold is paying you back, you can't ask them to pay a high interest rate. But that's where the credit ratings come in for all the other bonds and the other corporations. And some corporations might be struggling, but they still need to borrow money. Well, then as an investor, you can ask them to pay a higher interest rate. Okay. And so um, based on their credit rating, based on their credit worthiness, investors might still be able, be interested in lending them money, but they want a higher interest rate of return for the loan. Those are unsecured bonds. Unsecured because it's simply the reputation of the company based on its credit rating that they're borrowing money from investors. Uh, even though these are called types of bonds, they're actually more like features of bonds. There's, there's two uh, big features that are here. Uh, one is a convertible bond. Let's talk about those first. And unlike the picture here, it's not something that the top goes down. Um, a convertible bond basically, again, think about what a bond is. It's a loan from an investor. So if an investor has lent his or her money to a corporation in the form of a bond, they're a bondholder. In a, if the bond has a convertible feature, the bondholder can convert his or her bond into a certain number of shares of common stock. That's all determined up front. And that's the conversion feature. Uh, the, the bondholder can be converted into a stockholder. Okay. Once the bondholder converts to common stock, they're no longer a bondholder, they're a stockholder in the, in the corporation. And so that's a, convert, that's a convertible bond. And it's strictly, the feature is for the bondholder. The bondholder can exercise it, or the bondholder doesn't want to exercise it. They don't have to. But it's a kind of a cool feature. The second feature really benefits the corporation. A callable bond simply means that the, remember, the bond is a loan from investors. So the callable bond means it can be paid back early. Most bonds are for 10 years to 20 years in length. So when a corporation goes to the to the bond market looking for investors to lend money uh, to them. They're usually uh, selling, uh, issuing these bonds for the long term, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, okay? So if that bond has a call feature, in other words, if it's a callable bond, basically the company can pay it back early at any given time that's stated in the contract. So um, that doesn't benefit the bondholder. <laughs> that benefits the corporation who issued the bond. Okay. Um, so that's how that feature works. We're going to look at a bond certificate uh, on the next slide here. Um, just understand that bonds are, are uh, one bond is a thousand dollar loan to a corporation. So whatever the face value of the bond is, will tell you how many how many loans, how many bonds that represents. A maturity date is, is the actual uh, date you get your money back. Again, every bond is a thousand dollar loan. The maturity date, whether it's 10 years later or 15 years later is the date you're gonna get your thousand dollars back. But what are you getting in the meantime? You're getting interest, you're getting interest payment. And a bond is a contract uh, between the lenders and the corporation that's asking for money. And so that contract has an interest rate that's uh, guaranteed, okay? And so that's uh, called a contractual interest rate. It's, sometimes it's called a coupon. There's a lot of different uh, terms for it. So this is what a bond actually looks like. You don't really see them very often because they are a bit shy. Um, as you see, this particular bond is a $5,000 bond. Okay, which means that this represents five bonds. It's a, it's five loans to a company, right? Because each loan is a thousand dollars. So this is a, a equivalent of five bonds or a five thousand dollar loan. Okay, 
Uh, what you'll see is um, every bond is registered to the person who lent the money. So you will see exactly your name and other information will be here. It's all registered information. So there's a, there's a legal, um, it's part of the contract that you are the lender here and you have a certain rights under the contract as the lender. Okay. Um, there is, like I said, a maturity date. Well, you, you lent $5,000 for this company. Um, when are they paying you back? This particular company is gonna be paying them back uh, on May the 1st of 2021. However, this is an old picture here of a bond. Um, what's the guaranteed uh, contractual rate on that bond? Well, here, 5.75%. So uh, $57.50 per thousand dollars per year okay so this particular bond because it's a five thousand dollar bond uh this person whoever loaned that money is going to be uh collecting somewhere north of 250 275 thousand dollars sorry 275 dollars a year on each thousand on, uh, on each of these uh on this this particular investment okay the bond is actually paid twice a year. So the interest is sent to the owner twice a year. Okay. So $57.50 per thousand, half of it is sent every six months for whatever long, whatever period it is, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, you're gonna be getting a check every six months until you get your money back. You'll get the actual loan back and the very last interest payment on the due date, on the due date, okay. So um, that's basically uh, the bond. You don't really have to worry about market prices or other things like that, or the accounting for issuing bonds. You don't have to worry about that, but you do have to know how um, uh, bonds look like on the balance sheet. So how long-term liabilities look like on the balance sheet and two pieces of analysis, I think three pieces of analysis actually in this chapter uh, for, for bonds. So as you see, liabilities, as you know, from way back in chapter two, are broken into uh, current liabilities and long-term liabilities, right? Current liabilities within a year of whatever date is on the balance sheet, uh, long-term liabilities over a year from that date. Again, you'll always see bonds payable here. What's interesting is you have, for current liabilities, there's notes payable here, but under long-term liabilities, you'll also see notes payable. And so um, what's the difference here? The due dates are the difference. This is a notes payable, and that's also a notes payable. The difference is this note has a maturity date. This is not, this is not due to be paid back until over a year. These notes are due to be paid back this year. And look at that current maturity of the long term debt, right? That current payment of any long term debt that's due this year is part of the current. All right, three little pieces of analysis, and then we are pretty much uh, good for today, and you'll be off to doing your reading and homework. Um, the first piece of analysis is something you've seen before the current ratio way back in. Chapter two, we looked at current assets to current liabilities, right? Current assets to current liabilities. And so for General Motors in 2014, um, they had 83 billion, 670 million of current assets, 65 billion, 701 million of current liabilities, current ratio of 1.27 to one, that's a dollar and 27 cents of current assets for every dollar of current liabilities. So they're above one to one, which of course the industry is at one to one. They basically have a buck in current assets for every buck in current liabilities. So that's that's not, uh, you don't really wanna be in this place or below. So the fact that GM is a little bit higher than that means it's good for them, but I wouldn't be writing home about it or, or bragging about it. Uh, it needs to be better than that. Um, uh, two other ratios. Um, uh, that you're going to be looking at. One you've already seen before, although I don't think you can really see it here without like super, you need like Superman vision to see this stuff, uh, you know, but the debt to asset ratio, you might recall this from chapter two, because it's a repeat. 
Uh, and it simply looks at the, the total liabilities over the total assets, okay? So this, you've seen this before, and for General Motors in 2014, and again, you're gonna have to trust me on this if you can't read it. Um, this uh, General Motors has 141 uh, plus billion of liabilities and 177 plus billion of total assets. 80% debt to asset ratio, that's very high. That means that 80% of their assets have been financed through debt, okay? So uh, that's a relatively high ratio compared to the industry, which is 62%, that's very, very high. So this might signify that, that GM has more, uh, more debt than they might need. And is that, is that bothering the company long-term? Is it a risk? It might be. Well, that's something, this is something new you're gonna uh, read about here called the times interest earned ratio. And all this says is basically, if you look at the interest payment uh, that they have, which is their interest expense, uh, how much is their uh, net income covering all of that? Okay, how much are their profits covering all of that interest payment that they have to make? So for the uh, times interest earned, it's the net income plus the, in, uh, the interest expense plus the income tax expense divided by the interest expense. And here, GM is in really good shape. Their profits are greater than 11 times what they pay in interest. Uh, whereas the industry, their profits are only three times what they pay in interest. So uh, GM has a lot more profits to cover that interest payment than the industry does on its long-term debt, even though their long-term debt is less in terms of its ratio. Okay, how much fun is that? A lot of fun, right? Okay, <clears throat> questions? 